Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for joining. Um, I trust you can all see us, and uh, we are going to get started here. Because of the nature of this platform, I need to remove one of our speakers before I can begin uh, with the slides. So I just want to say thank you and introduce everyone. I'm Ryan Patterson with the Maryland State Arts Council. Uh, we have Stuart Eisenberg joining us, Liz Cornish, and Shelton Hawkins. They'll each be um, introducing themselves further as we go. But for now, I'm sorry, we have to lose Stuart and we will get started. So welcome to Policy, Placemaking, and Public Infrastructure. Again, I'm Ryan Patterson. Uh, we like to begin these sessions with a simple land acknowledgement. Uh, land acknowledgement is a powerful way of showing respect and a step toward correcting the stories and practices that have erased indigenous stories. Every community owes its existence and vitality to generations from around the world who've contributed their energy to making the history that led to this moment. Some were brought here against their will, some were drawn to leave their distant homes in hope of a better life, and some have lived on this land for more generations than can be counted. We acknowledge we are standing on ancestral lands, and we honor the thousands of enslaved Africans whose lives were physically and spiritually sore. We pay respect to their elders, past and present. Thank you. So we're going to begin with Liz Cornish, the Executive Director of Bike More, and I will advance the slides. Liz, let me know when you're ready. All right. Well, good evening, everyone. Um, thank you so much for joining us, especially at the end of your busy day. Um, I'm Liz Cornish. I'm the executive director of Bike More. We are Baltimore City's livable space advocacy organization. And so we work on policy issues related to walking, biking, and transit, um, as well as place making um, and then programs. Um, we get spikes for free. We work on rides. Um, right now, we're hosting things like a virtual um, bike mechanic class. So we're trying to be adaptive um, and bring people together. So thank you, Ryan, um, the Maryland State um, Council, for inviting me today. Next slide. So what I'm going to talk about today is very often um, municipalities, community groups, uh, one of the most common ways that people try to um, imagine public art is by combining public art with some other use. And one of those uses uh, that I see a lot of is public art um, as a bike rack or bike rack as public art. Um, and that makes sense. Um, you want something eye catching, but if you're going to invest money, um, particularly money that comes from tax dollars um, that people have invested in, you want it to be utilitarian. So there's no harm, no foul in wanting to pursue this, but sometimes these um, installations miss the mark. Um, either they end up being less than ideal pieces of public art, or more often they end up being um, less ideal and non-functioning bike racks. And so you lose that utility, um, and therefore um, maybe not making the best investment. And so this is about just saying that you all invest a lot of time and energy into these projects, and um, I just want to make sure they're as successful as possible. So there are specifications on what makes a good bike rack, And so that's what's on the page right now. So you um, want them to be close to things. I don't want to have to walk around behind the building where it's dark, where people may not see me, where I might not find it um, to lock up my bike, where my bike can't be watched by people that might be generally on the street, making it vulnerable to theft. You want it to be secure to the ground um, a lot of times when I'm locking my bike, I make sure to kind of wiggle it. Um, very often bolts can dislodge from the concrete over time, or especially if they're installed in something like brick. Uh, so you want it to have um, both stability and potentially a maintenance plan um, to continue to check on that stability. You want them to accommodate a standard U lock. And so this is sort of the standard U with the key um, or maybe a combination. This is the standard of probably what's the most safest lot, particularly for um, uses where you're going to be using your bike a lot. Um, there's, you know, a kid's bike could probably use the cable um, with that for just like a quick lockup. 
But if you're going to be using your bike a lot, particularly if your bike starts to have value, you're going to want to start looking for places that fit a U lock. And you want it to at least fit a couple of bikes. Um, bikes have different handlebar setups, they have different heights, and so it can often be difficult to have bikes fit together in a way that's not going to cause damage to the other bike, or it's just the way it's designed, you just can't fit multiple bikes on there. Um, because when you don't provide enough bike parking, that's when people start to lock the things that you don't want them to lock to. Um, like street signs that might block ADA accessibility or even more trees. Um, all right, next slide. So um, what I want to make available to you is that there are resources available um, either through maybe your Department of Planning or your Department of Transportation or even um, private companies that where you're going to purchase these racks from, if you don't may not have those resources that's available to you, some smaller place, um, places that you live just don't. Um, and so there's a way, there's specific distances and there's things to look for. And so when I'm looking for a safe place to lock up my bike, I'm looking for a few things. Um, I want to make sure that there are two points of contact so that there's two places that I could potentially lock my bike, the frame and the wheel. Um, that's the most secure way to lock your bike. I want to make sure that there's space between the racks. Um, sometimes I see people install racks too close together, and that way you just really eliminate one whole side of both of those racks. Um, and you want to make sure there's space between the rack and a wall. Um, a bike um, is not just the length of the handlebar to the seat. You're going to have that front wheel or rear wheel that extends. And so you want to make sure that you maintain the distance from the wall while allowing the bike to line up properly to the rack. All right, next slide. And so this is an example of a diagram that gets into the specific measurements. Um, this is actually a diagram that you can find on the Dero website. So that's a company that sells bike racks, that's D-E-R-O. And it's a company that we work with a lot um, when we're working with private businesses that want to install bike parking. Um, so these are what's called setbacks. So where are you going to place those bike racks either in private or public right of way? Um, and so these are just, this is just mostly to know, you don't have to write down these dimensions, but to know that they exist and that you don't have to come up with them on your own. Next slide. Um, and then also I want to talk to you, if, if somebody doesn't ride a bike on the regular, they may not just know the most secure way to lock a bike. And so this is a good diagram um, that I show people. It's probably the easiest and most secure. So you have the frame and the rear wheel secured. And then you have a cable that extends to the front wheel. So this protects the entire bike. Um, one of the things that I like to teach people is that a bike is only secure when you lock inside the triangle. So you have this sort of semi-triangle that becomes the inside of the frame. If your lock is somewhere else on the bike, chances are um, it's not actually locked in the rack. So sometimes it can, I mean, I've made the mistake before where like you just put the lock in and you end up missing the frame. Um, so yeah, so sometimes depending on how you have to orient the bike, I need to make sure that it can touch either um, the front stem right underneath the handlebars or I can lock it turned in the direction where I have um, the rear part of the frame. And that's a good way to assess, like as you're designing public art, you look at this ideal diagram of how to lock up a bike and you practice and you're like, okay, can I install this idea in the dimensions that we know make a good bike rack installation? And then does the public art as design allow for probably the ideal bike locking um, situation? You plan for the work, um, plan for the best, you know? Um, all right, great. So what makes good public art? Liz, I'm sorry to interrupt. I'm just going to mute Shelton and I so your audio quality sounds a little better. Okay. No worries. Um, so I, what makes good public art? Um, you all, if you're attending this conference, definitely have more experience um, evaluating this, thinking through these problems and challenges. And so I'm going to touch on just a few of the actual like logistical mechanical parts and leaving out some of the very important um, social impacts and cultural impacts that public art has as value. Um, but when you're deciding on public art, you also want to make sure that it has a good location, that it's close to things where people are going to travel, um, that it's easy to find so that the value that you've invested in the public art is visible to the public. 
you want it to be safe. You want it to be in a well-lit area. This helps reduce things like vandalism, but also protects anybody that's going to be viewing the art. Um, and then you want it secured to the ground. If it is an installation, and typically most are, um, there has to be some way to fasten it. And so this idea that a bike rack needs to be really secure to the ground and a piece of public art needs to be really secure to the ground, these things coincide. Um, and so as you're, so it's okay. And there's actually a really good overlap of, okay, well, the logistics and specs on a piece of public art actually overlap with the logistics and specs of a bike rack. All right, next slide. And so um, this is sort of the visual, right? Like public art is its own thing. Bike racks is its own thing. And sometimes they do different things. Like sometimes bike racks are ugly. Um, and not very aesthetically pleasing. And sometimes public art just isn't necessarily designed to be utilitarian, nor should it be. There is inherent value in it just being art and not necessarily have a utilitary or have a have utility to it. Um, but if you're looking at making um, the public art bike rack, you really need those two things, like everything that you check off on both things to coincide. Next slide. And so what I wanna share with you is just quickly run through some photos. Um, these are pictures of bad bike racks. So if you are a person that's riding a bike and you come across bike racks like this, you are gonna to walk to something else. A lot of it has to do, um, if you're looking at the screen, the one in the um, bottom left, the sort of um, U half U shape, you can only lock the wheel. And we've talked about that. Secure lock, you have to lock inside the frame. Um, looking at the potato masher turned into wave rack, um, that is very difficult to fit more than one bike. So you'll see maybe two bikes locked to the outside, but then it's really hard to fit handlebar setup or seat setups to use the middle of the rack. And there's just really no way to get more than one bike in there. And then you have um, this other standard rack. Uh, it is you know, very common to see this um, outside spaces. It actually doesn't make a terrible bike rack for things like special events when you only need temporary bike parking. Um, but again, this is one of those things where traditionally it's intended for you just to put the wheel in, makes it hard to have places to lock the frame. So then you'll only find people using the outside and not really using all of the spaces. Next slide. And so I'm gonna share with you a few challenging. So you have this visual of like, what isn't a good bike rack? And you have some specs that you know bike racks feel. So, um, you know, if we were hanging out in person, this would be a more interactive conversation. But imagining I would be sitting and be like, what's the problem with the lion? And then you would say that they're too close together. So there's no way you're gonna fit a bike rack in this. And I wanna be very clear, I definitely Googled and researched, all of these are supposed to be bike racks. Um, this is not me pulling up public art and saying you can't park a bike there. Um, this other one is a hexagon. Um, this was installed by a private business right here in Baltimore. Um, it is not, one of the things that I forgot to mention is the dimension of the tube and often whether or not it's square or round. And so this rack gets a lot of flack here in Baltimore City because it's um, large and sort of has these sharp edges in their tubing. And so you, it's very difficult um, with a standard U lock to fit both the frame and a lock um, given the dimension um, of the piece. Next slide. Um, and so again, these are just examples of where I showed you the not great designed bike racks turned into public art. So it's really important to look at when you're designing the art um, that is going to also serve as a bike rack, if it looks like some of those um, bike racks that are not efficient, not functional, then you know you're headed in the wrong direction. Um, so they look cool, but don't really serve a purpose. And you can see the barks, bikes parked in the one on the left. They just don't have any way to purchase um, inside the frame. All right, next slide. Um, so again, similar, right? Um, even though this looks really cool, um, it's a big comb, um, you really, it's, it just still emulates the same problematic bike rack that you saw in the last picture. Um, and then one of the things that we always say to people, and I know you say they get this with art, if you have to have a sign that explains what it is, it's probably not very well designed. Next slide. Um, and so again, 
everybody, um, and this one I see a lot more often in that as we're redesigning public spaces as a whole, you really want all of the features to blend in together. So you have a vision for a public square and then you're like, okay, well we need bike racks and the bike racks need to emulate maybe the fencing or the design of a fountain over here. So how do we bring that same aesthetic into the bike rack? So clearly somebody tried very hard um, and ended up making pretty non-functional bike racks. Next slide. Um, and I wanted to share this because you're like, okay, Liz, well, is there any way to do this right? So what I'm gonna share with you here is they got really close. Um, in this one. So um, the teardrops, I think they look really cool. I bet they would look cool from multiple angles. Um, they are very closely resemble the standard U-Rack, which is like not the prettiest, but it's standard for a reason for how well it locks up lots of different styles of bikes. So it's pretty good. But I think because of the curvature at the top, there's probably going to be some challenges um, having it be wide enough to be able to have two points of purchase, particularly on multiple bikes that are locked to it. Um, but I would lock my bike to that and feel pretty okay. And then the next one um, is this thing, you'll see the standard U rack, which is great. Um, and then a lot of people will brand the rack. So a little different than public art, but sometimes this is part of a whole um, branding of public space. And um, one of the things that I've seen with these designed is that the space in between whatever you put in the middle isn't engineered in a way that you can actually fit the lock um, in multiple places in between the logo um, and the, the thing. So I might be able to lock like below the logo, but it might be difficult to lock between the centerpiece and the rack. All right, next slide. And so I wanted to show you ones that I thought were kind of cool that I think would work. Um, people that live here that ride bikes might prove me wrong, but my judgment in doing some research and pulling up photos was I thought these qualified as sort of that um, activating public space with something artistic, but also provide a functional bike rack. And so the baseballs, I think, um, create multiple points of contact as long as that inside piece is also well welded and secure. Um, and then the, the animals, I think, will have enough um, places that it can actually accommodate lots of different heights and lengths and sizes of bikes and probably um, accommodate um, really good um, on either side. I would say the one downside um, that I'm like in looking at these is the animals are a little close to the curb. So it might be hard to like wedge a bike in between that and a parked car. Or if you have a really expensive bike, you may not want it that close to moving traffic or a parked car that could open a door into it. So that's also something to consider is like proximity to the right of way. And then the baseballs, uh, maybe it gets too close to the fence, but I think these are pretty good examples. And then in between the baseballs, you see that there's actually a standard blue rack that you can order from private companies in between. And so that's another option um, is you can always look at really good um, public art. And if you want it to also be utilitarian, interdisperse some of these standard racks that you can buy um, from these companies. Um, but yeah, thank you so much for your time. And I look forward to fielding any questions if we have time at the end. I'm done. <laughs> Thanks so much, Liz. All right, I'm going to close you out and then um, we'll bring you back at the end for questions. Hey, Shelton. Okay, we should be able to hear you, and I'm going to go to your presentation. Hopefully, make myself. Okay, can you hear You hear me? Can you hear me? I'm muted. I think you. There you go. There you go. You're, you're good. I can hear you. Okay. There we go. I was muted. Um, first, I want to say thank you for the opportunity to be able to talk about uh, and say Liz did an amazing job for, for uh, talking about bike routes. Really informative. I actually learned a lot. So it's pretty cool. <clears throat> 
Chilton, you're a little bit low to hear. Do okay. you have headphones to put on? I do. Let me put my headphones in. That might help. All right. Let's see if this helps. What about now? Can you hear me? Can you hear me? You okay? Oh well, I just wanted to say thank you again for the opportunity. Um, like I was saying earlier, I thought Liz uh, slides was very informative, and thought she did an amazing job. So my name is Shelton Hawkins. I'm currently an art teacher in St. Charles High School. Um, before this, I was a college basketball coach for the last three years at University of Maryland Eastern Shore. So my background is in basketball and art. I played basketball my whole life and I kind of did art my whole life. So kind of wanted to come up with a project to kind of merge the two and we have Plan Color. Next slide. So this is the Plan Color logo. I knew I wanted to use a basketball and I knew I wanted to use multi-colors just to sort of the logo kind of stood out a little bit. Next slide, Ron. So a lot of times people ask me, what is Plan Color? And, and plant color is something, uh, it's, it's a community project that uses public basketball courts as a canvas for creative expression in order to strengthen community ties and inspire multi-generational play. <clears throat> the, concept, the concept for the project was to be able to use geometric shapes and bright colors to attract the youth. And we wanted to be able to create, inspire social interaction between different ages, no matter race, religion or color. So next slide. All right, so for me, where, where playing color actually started was in 2003. My cousin James Thomas passed away on a basketball court in Eastern Maryland. He was playing basketball. He went up for a dunk. He dunked it and then he slipped off the pavement. So early on, the basketball courts have wasn't very well kept or taken care of. So it was kind of like an issue. James was a huge person in our community. Um, he was actually on his way to go play college basketball. He had just signed his letter to go play college basketball, and he was only 22 years old. And the sad part about the story is the, the court in the hospital is one mile away, and it took 45 minutes for the ambulance to get there. So the time the ambulance got there, it was already too late. So next slide. So this is the picture of what the basketball court looked like in 2017. And it looked even worse in 2003. Um, the picture to the left is the actual court that he actually passed away on, where you see the, the difference between the ground and the dirt. So it was very uneven. Like a lot of kids kept getting hurt, rolling on their ankles. And the same thing for the benches that are like in the dirt, actually sitting in the dirt. You couldn't even sit, sit in the benches. And I kind of gave you an overview of what the whole court kind of looks like with the lines in between and the piping. It was just very uneven outdoor basketball court. Um, so I, I knew I wanted to change um, the look of the basketball court. Next slide, Ryan, please. So in 2006, I was a junior in college. I wrote a letter to the, the town where I was living at to actually do uh, to do a renovation on a basketball court. At the time, I had a good friend who was uh, working at Nike, and Nike was going to come in and pay for the whole project to get the project done. But at the time, the town didn't think it was a good idea to have uh, – they didn't want kids hanging out at the basketball court. So they didn't think it was a good opportunity or good timing to have redoing things for the basketball court. So they just told us no, and they left the basketball courts the way they was. So for years, I kept the idea and kept working at it and kept working at it. And then in 2017, I met Megan Cook and everything changed. So you can go next slide. So here is an early, <laughs> an early, sketch of what I wanted the basketball court. I know I wanted to use um, large shapes and a lot of colors just to get kids like excited about baby go out there and take pictures and interact with the space. This was a really bad first sketch, but it goes to show you like, you know, you just have to keep plugging away until it actually makes sense. So this was my first sketch. Uh, you can go to the next slide. So for two years, I spent a lot of time traveling around the world to go look at what people consider some of the best art, best art destination basketball courts in the world. So I went to Paris, I went to Brazil, New York, Missouri. Um, this, this court to the right is actually like two miles uh, outside of Ferguson. So this court was like done for the community to try to bring the community together. And it's actually three large scale basketball courts all put together. And last year this court was uh, nominated for outdoor basketball court of the year and 
won a whole bunch of awards. But I kind of wanted to see like the different styles of paint and how does the paint wear over the years and how long does the paint last? So I did my research for two years, just traveling around the country, just seeing different basketball courts. Next slide. So after me going around traveling for two years, I came back with a new, I spent a little bit of time in, in Puerto Rico. I went to an art gallery and I seen this painting and it kind of like gave me this idea for um, the design that I did with the basketball court. And this is my second design, my second sketch or mock-up of what I wanted the court to actually look like. Um, I knew I wanted to use like a lot of colors. I knew I wanted to use geometric shape because the basketball court is actually a mile away from the high school and middle school. So I wanted to provide a, a space that um, a math teacher could use, but also a PE teacher could use. If you know, you can take kids there, you can play geometric games on it, you can play math games, but you also can play basketball games as well. Next slide. Right. So what we did was we, we didn't have enough funding, so we sent out packages, and this was like an example of a package. So every package that we sent out to a person had a letter, came with a t-shirt, came with a design, a handwritten note, and an actual patch of the actual plan color court to try to get people to donate funds and that's how we end up raising money um next slide and what we did also was we went to uh after the town liked the idea so much that they did they wanted us to do both public space basketball courts and in a town that we live in so it was two basketball courts and i didn't want to design both basketball courts i didn't want the aesthetic to kind of feel the same as, as you know as mine so we came up with a contest for the middle school and high school kids to be able to design a basketball court and we picked the winner. We had 300 kids submit um, designs and we kind of narrowed it down and we actually picked the ladies who I think is next next slide. Oh, well, I guess not, <laughs> sorry. Oh, that's okay. Um, Ryan, you can go back to that slide. Let me talk a little bit about this slide. Um, the other side, Ryan, please. Yep, this slide. So we ended up picking a lady named Callie who uh, won $500 from Maryland Arts Council and also helped towards her scholarship. Uh, she ended up going to art school at Temple University. Um, so it was good. Her court came out really good and I kind of wanted a different different looking court than mine. And I also was happy that it was um, a lady, a young lady actually won that one. So pretty good. Next slide, please. And while we was painting the basketball courts, once we got all the funding and the go ahead, I kind of wanted to talk about like how many volunteers we had. We had over 60 volunteers come out to help paint the basketball court, or well, both basketball courts. And it took about 10 days because we painted in June. So it was a couple of rainy days. It took a little bit longer than what we was expecting. Um, but this is just a picture of different volunteers and how busy it was when we was painting the courts. And that's a picture of Megan Cook uh, in the bottom right hand side who kind of change the, the dynamics of the, the plan color process. Next slide. So this is the young lady court, Callie. Uh, her court is beautiful, especially at sunset, like when the, the colors look really good. Uh, she designed this as a senior in high school to the freshman last year. So this is her court. It's a beautiful court. I love what she did with the gradient colors and the grays and the colors and yeah. Next slide. And then here is the actual painted court that I designed. Uh, it's called Ottawa Park. So we put the logo on it. Again, if you know, now that you can see the actual shapes and see how big the shapes are. So it was good just to be able to see the middle schools this year and the high school um, math department use the basketball court to work on the shapes and, and showing that the court was multi-purpose. So this is the, this is the one of uh, a couple of ones that I designed so far. Next clip, please. So since our court did so well, we had the opportunity to paint LeBron James court, which is the court at the top left that says we are family. And then it has uh, one over top of it. So I got the chance to go to Akron, Ohio um, to paint LeBron James court at his school, which was really amazing. Also, when we did our uh, availing of the basketball court, we have over 400 people come out to watch. We had an outdoor basketball game. We had over 400 people come out to a, a basketball park to watch basketball, which is really cool. And the best thing about it, this picture in the bottom left-hand corner is uh, James Thomas, my cousin, whose son passed away. So his son got to actually come out there and we presented the court to him. So that was really cool. Um, the picture in the middle is the basketball jerseys that we designed for the court. We did basketballs and we did, you know, just a whole 
we wanted to, to really present the community with a whole, like a whole event. So everything like made sure everything was brand new and looked really good. We made front page of the newspaper in, in Talbot County, which for me was important because it's rare that you get to see, you know, three African-American men in the front of the newspaper for doing something really positive for the community. So I took a lot of pride for that. The governor came down, the couple of big shots came down to, to come look at the basketball court and, you know, everybody loved what they saw. Next slide, Ryan, please. And thank you. Um, for me, playing color was or has been an opportunity for my community to to really engage with each other. Um, we we everybody's been using the basketball court. It's been good for the community, and I'm super proud to be a part of the project. All right, thank y'all. If y'all have any questions, I'll make sure I stick around. Thank you so much, Shelton. That's amazing. I'm gonna bring on Stuart here, our last presenter. Okay. And as he's um, invited him, as he's coming up. Um, um, okay, there you go. All right, so we're gonna meet you, Shelton, and we'll come back. I'm gonna mute myself. And can you just give us a mic check, Stuart? Sure thing. Can you hear me? Yep. Okay, good. Let me know when you're ready. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Stuart Eisenberg, Executive Director for the Hyattsville Community Development Corporation in Prince George's County, Maryland. And I work uh, to help uh, administer the Prince George's County Gateway Arts and Entertainment District as well. And uh, this project is uh, part of uh, what we're doing in the Arts District to uh, transform everything uh, into a, a public art that uh, contributes to public spaces in a way that's unique. So initially, uh, I, I had seen the, my first uh, wrapped traffic box in Bozeman, Montana, and I thought, what a cool idea. And in 2015, we began researching this uh, project to see if we could do it. Uh, in our jurisdiction and discovered that uh, there were a couple of uh, transformer boxes painted in uh, Ocean City, Maryland. So we're not the first to decorate these, uh, these, these boxes, uh, but we were the first to bring wrap technology and put them on uh, the boxes that control signalized intersections. Um, and we, we ended up doing a lot of research so that we could present a, a strong case to the various powers that be uh, in Prince George's County and at uh, State Highway Administration because we thought we would get pushback. And uh, if you give the next slide, um, it took one meeting with Prince George's County uh, before we uh, got the surprise, heck yeah, let's do this. Um, and uh, four or five conditions under which uh, we had to perform. And they let us write the agreement uh, that set the terms and uh, away we went. And for their trouble, what we got was, Ryan, next slide. These, these pieces here, um, we did five uh, designs across 11 sites two in Hyattsville and nine in uh, transforming neighborhood initiative communities uh, in the Western and Southern uh, part of the county. And uh, each of the, the, the boxes has a credit block and uh, turns out they, they, they came out incredibly well, I, I, I think. Um, we did this project with uh, five different juries uh, because the the sites were in different uh, jurisdictions and we wanted local input to be uh, present and it's important for for communities to have representation in the art that goes up in in their uh, jurisdictions so uh, that was a little bit interesting to handle but uh, we got we got used to that and we've done a lot of public art projects with varying juries and so uh we we had a setup that enabled it uh so our next stop we had 
after this project was to get funding uh, for a larger uh, a larger reach and to work with uh, State Highway Administration because we had targeted so many blighted uh, signal boxes in Prince George's County, uh, mostly in the in the Gateway Arts District uh, in Hyattsville that were uh, on State Highway Administration uh, property. Uh, and so when we approached them, uh, again, uh, we, 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 we weren't expecting a, a yes right away. And in fact, uh, we got two no's uh, within a week uh, when, we, when we approached State Highway Administration. Uh, one of them basically said that it's gonna damage the boxes and so it'll damage the equipment and they have to maintain the signal equipment for public safety reasons. So we had done our homework and one of the manufacturers of uh, these uh, signalized, uh, uh, these, these boxes for signalized intersections is a company called Econolite. And it turns out that they have their own wrapping uh, process. And uh, so when we pointed that out to the state, um, they lost that excuse to say no, um, but they had more. So we had to persist a little bit, um, but the notion of the wrap and why it's so important is uh, it prevents graffiti because it's a graffiti resistant uh, material that's easily cleaned if the if the paint sticks. Um, markers can't stick to it either. It's resistant to acid, uh, to uh, paint, and uh, it doesn't fade in sunlight. Uh, it requires some prep to put up and uh, it's an involved process, but uh, there's, there's uh, really strong reasons to do it because in the painting context uh, of just painting over these, uh, these boxes that get tagged, um, it just attracts more graffiti. Uh, if you've ever worked with graffiti artists, you know that when something gets painted over, it's called priming. And uh, priming is an invitation for more graffiti. So if you paint over somebody's tag, the next tagger is going to come along and say, thanks, um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do it now. It's my turn. So this takes away that uh, opportunity. And not that I want to suppress graffiti art, I think there's a time and place for it, but these signalized uh, intersection uh, traffic control boxes are not the place. So at any rate, if, if I could have the next slide, Ryan. Um, the State Highway Administration, and I know this, this is hard to see, but I wanted you to have a scale. The State Highway Administration then said, oh, it's going to be very distracting and, and it's not safe. Uh, so we pointed out uh, that there were 200 communities that had already uh, instituted programs and, and we had information about each and every one of those programs that was on point. And we shared uh, contact and research and characterized the different ways that the communities did them, how they funded them, how they maintained them, if there was an agreement with the jurisdiction or not, and uh, presented all of that. Um, that didn't get rid of the nose, but it, uh, it it certainly gave us another nine months of negotiation before we got to our last no. Um, and so le left with all these no's and, and already being awarded funding to do this project, uh, no just wasn't an option. And for those people who work with me, they, they also understand that no is just an opportunity for a yes. Um, and so, uh, we went to the state legislature and uh, came with a, a, a bill that we had researched and uh, got uh, Delegate uh, Washington, uh, one of our reps in the 22nd district, to drop this this uh, this proposal into the uh, into the mix, and uh, we we got this passed. Um, SHA dragged its feet a little bit more because they weren't done with their no. But uh, after a year, we managed to get this into Comar with uh, practices and procedures. And so for that trouble, after two and a half years and countless hours to get permission, um, our next slide so shows uh, somewhat what we got. Now, this, this slide shows how we prepare the wrap for the printer. Um, we use a template and we manipulate the art to work 
uh, on, on the template. Um, and so this goes to the printer and when it comes back and gets uh, wrapped, the next uh, slide shows what it looks like. So these are, these are sites uh, in, in Hyattsville, um, some of the art that, that we've, uh, we've, we've put up. And uh, next slide. We, we also like to show where in the town it is. So we, we maintain this information on our website and uh, provide guidance uh, to the folks that we work with. And you know we've got this map also for State Highway Administration. So they know where our, our work is in case they're planning on replacing uh, up a traffic signal box. Um, now, next slide, please. Here's, here's a piece of, uh, of design that we really loved, but in the end, uh, one, of the, one of the terms that uh, we came up with with uh, the state uh, was no, no advertising on, on state property. And uh, they had never heard of pop art and Andy Warhol. And uh, Liza Fenner will, will attest that we, we, we worked uh, pretty hard trying to make the case to State Highway that uh, this indeed uh, formed art. It was a perfect uh, design for one of these signal boxes, but uh, to no avail. Um, and, and Old Bay, which is such a Maryland icon, just didn't, didn't get the public airing that that it should, although we're we're saving this design for uh, a privately owned box, and I'll get to the different types of boxes in a minute. Next slide. So, the the sizes and shapes of the uh, the boxes uh, vary, and so we have to create a variety of templates uh, in which to work with the artists to get the final art uh, ready for for the printer and. Uh, so we, we develop these uh, different templates and have them on hand. Unfortunately, the manufacturers keep changing the sizes of the boxes with every year and every issuance and, and different boxes for different applications. And some of the boxes that are out there are 40 years old. Uh, so there, there's, there's, I don't know, 200 different designs out there and we don't have them all yet, but we're working on it. Uh, next slide. Uh, so after we did the project uh, on the state highway boxes, uh, we got a lot of inquiries from jurisdictions and we began working with, uh, with different towns in Prince George's County to uh, implement uh, a, a program. And so we'll send out a call for artists that uh, might reflect the town's uh, desires for an aesthetic. Uh, we didn't really set an aesthetic on the first two calls we did. Uh, in fact, for those calls, basically we asked uh, artists to submit designs on existing art. We didn't want anyone to take any time on new design, but rather the commission would be for allowing us to use the, the art in, in this context. And so, with a limited uh, use license uh, agreement, we uh, set a $500 commission and urged uh, through our call that nobody do original art. Uh, we didn't we didn't say no, uh, but we we discouraged it uh, because we think the artist should make some money, and uh, we had limited budgets, but that was a way to work it. And so you can go on. When we put a proposal to a town uh, forward, we try to design the project uh, to their needs. And so we create an overview that gives them uh, the story of how the project will be administered. Next slide. Um, we'll give them uh, a timeline and uh, try to de define all the variables uh, so that the town knows what to expect and is happy with the results. Uh, so creating design criteria, uh, who's going to be on the selection panel, if there's a selection panel, that is, and uh, how, how the stages will go. Next slide. Um, again, we, we have a variety of calls for artists that we use that contain some of the technical details of the project, as well as 
the, the governing goals, the selection criteria, and uh, many of you uh, manage calls for artists and know what goes into them. And so we, we tailor this for this type of project uh, because we're, as I say, we're trying to minimize the amount of work an artist has to do so that they can submit uh, designs that, that are extant. Our first call actually netted over 150 submissions. And uh, it was gratifying because we're still using art from, from that first call as well as subsequent calls to meet um, the demands of, of local jurisdictions for these projects. Um, next slide. And another way that we, we did the selection process was through a, uh, a crowdsourcing uh, process. And so uh, we, we set up a website and uh, our jury selected down to a, a manageable number for the community to vote on. And uh, that's how we ended up with, uh, with the designs for the, the Hyattsville project. Next slide. Um, our jury processes vary uh, depending on uh, the composition of the jury. So uh, we try to give our jury, uh, we do a two-stage process where the first stage is online and people are giving their impressions. And it's kind of like the sorting hat when we have so many, uh, so many submissions to narrow down the field to, to, the, to the art that the community is really responding to through the jury. Um, and we characterize those and, and give the jury uh, a briefing paper, and then we meet in person and, and finish that process up. Next slide. All right. We're currently doing a project with uh, our partners uh, in Langley Park, uh, CASA, formerly CASA de Maryland. And this is a great project because it's uh, addressing a number of different things. No not just the blight of the box itself when, when the box gets degraded through vandalism, but, uh, next slide, uh, CASA had been uh, funded through the Department of Justice to address um, crime hotspots. And so they began a process of looking at the community um, in order to reduce crime through something called um, crime prevention through environmental design or SEPTED. Um, as it's known in the uh, planning world. Uh, next slide. And so their, their program involved getting out and getting a lot of input. Remember those days where you could meet people outside? Enjoy those pictures while you can. Um, and so they, they set up uh, a map to define crime hotspots in commercial and residential areas. And uh, it turns out that a lot of the goals that they uh, came up with through this process coincided with what our program could deliver in, in terms of changing the immediate environment around uh, one, of these, one of these boxes. Next slide. And so again, um, the, the, the jury process in, in this case was, was, was very tough because we had, we, we did an RFQ style call for artists where, where we initially just gathered concept designs, very just how would you approach this? Next slide. And so the local design community responded with small sketches, nothing too dramatically rendered, not a lot of time. Uh, in in the in the conception just indicate how you're going to address the design issue um, next slide and we narrowed it down to to three artists and uh, then uh, we we engaged each each of the three with a small stipend and uh, we we got a, a number of different uh, versions of of this and this this project is also an attempt to create through art uh, a small branding platform for Langley Park, so that each of the each of the different iterations along 14 of these uh, boxes will uh, have an identifiable design component, so that the whole project will like will be identifiable as the same thing and and really address uh, the identity of uh, Langley Park. Uh, 
Next slide. And so now we're in, in a, a COVID-19 social distancing input process. So we're, we're placing these signs out in the community to get uh, feedback and using a Facebook platform and a couple of other uh, media to get the input. Now, after a project is done, go ahead. You can, you can go. This is what we, we anticipate. And we've had such positive uh, response to this, this program. There are other types of boxes out there. Uh, Verizon, Pepco, uh, and private entities have a variety of different technology embodied in these boxes that are in the public sphere, all of them getting vandalized, or if not, just the desire to have something more interesting than just uh, a plain Jane box uh, out there is uh, is is present. So uh, we actually are in the process of negotiating agreements with Verizon and Pepco so that we can work on their technology as well. Um, thanks very much for your time. And uh, I know it was a tough act to follow Shelton and, and Liz. Thanks for bearing with me. And uh, I hope uh, if you have questions, I can answer some. Thanks. Wow, that was phenomenal. Um, as I bring Liz, Liz up, I'm going to um, please open up for questions. There's a question bar down at the bottom that you can ask a question. I see there's one in there right now, and it's like opening a present on Christmas to see what everybody is going to ask uh, for questions. So I can't wait to see that. Um, all right, I'm inviting Liz back in. And uh, I will point out that um, – we got Liz? Yeah, great. Thank you. So thank you all three of you so much for sharing your expertise. And what I didn't, maybe maybe I should have started out in the introduction. I think we are, of course, not covering all aspects of art and public infrastructure, but I think you guys have just really illustrated the way three passion and informed people can really help to um, guide artists and um, towards a successful outcome of a project that has has incorporated art. You've done the research of like learning the rules or learning the out, the guidelines. Maybe it's because you ride a bike or because you play basketball or because you bothered to figure out the proportions of these boxes, but you, you have done so much of the legwork to set people up for success uh, that is really helpful. Um, so thank you for that. And I, I think there's a lot to learn just from that process. Uh, a question for Shelton. What type of paint did you end up using? Can you share that trade secret? You gotta unmute him. Oh, oh I'm sorry, I can't see his face. There we go. Yeah, there, there you go. My mic was muted. <laughs> uh, so yeah, I definitely can share that secret. So we we use Promco from uh, Sherman Williams. It's a uh, it's outdoor paint, and the life is called Promco paint, and it's supposed to last between five to eight years. We did put down a sealer. Over yeah. once he did everything, so it lasts a little bit longer. But the thing about art is, we we wanted to get dirty. If it gets dirty, that means people actually plan on it's getting used. So it looks good those first couple of days when you take pictures and all that stuff. But after you play on it, then it you know it's, it looks like people been playing on, it, which is a good thing. So let me ask, follow up on that. Did you put anything on top or like a grit in there to keep from it being slippery? We definitely put a grit in there. Uh, that when you go to Sherman Williams, they offer this little grit that you mix with the paint. So, and, and that helps like when it rains or if the weather's bad, it kind of helps like keep you a little bit of traction and, and stuff like that. But it's called Promco Paint uh, from Sherman Williams. And I think that grit or something you can get maybe called like shark bite or shark. Yep. Yep. That's what we, yeah, whatever. Yep. I forgot what it is. Maybe a shark bite or shark. I know it's one of those two, but yeah. I, that's a tip for anybody trying to do, I've done sidewalk murals around storm drains and you really want to use that so they don't get slippery when it's wet. Yep. Um, what was the what's the general cost for one of the basketball projects and that might be a good actually a good question for everybody in your respective areas what's a good uh direction of budget for you know a basic bike rack what's a starter budget for a good one what's a basketball project run what's a traffic box project so we'll start with shelton Oh, I was gonna give it to Liz because I like her. Liz, I'll let you go first. <laughs> um, well, if you're gonna just buy a bike rack off the shelf, 
from a company. Um, you're looking at a standard URAC costing around $400. And that obviously doesn't include any labor or um, that you might need for the installation, but bike racks should come with the hardware that you need um, to install on different surfaces. And they also um, can have railings where you can connect bike racks to multiple railings so that if you have to um, install in like a less than desirable surface, it creates more um, security, I guess. But I mean, that's the exciting part about a bike rack for public art is that you can refine that budget however you want. And and so, yeah. Uh, well, I wish our answer was, was that easy. Uh, <laughs> just because <laughs> It, it depends. It really depends on the shape of the actual asphalt that you're going to be painting on, and it, so for us, we had to spend a little bit more because we wanted everything to be brand new and everything to last a little bit longer. Now, if you just want to go out and just paint a basketball court, you don't care if it still has the cracks in the line, you can do that for lowest two thousand dollars. But I, I wouldn't suggest that. I think if you're going to do a basketball court, you definitely want to fix the surface, get all the cracks out the lines, like make sure the court is level. Um, yeah. So it, it, I, I think the lowest is like ten thousand dollars. That's with your paint, your labor, and the highest could be uh, fifty thousand dollars. So it just kind of depends on how much work. Um, for us, we wanted brand new goals, so we bought brand new goals. We did everything, so we bought brand new goals, benches. It wasn't even a water fountain out there, so we got like vitamin water that came and gave us a water fountain. So it just depends on the actual surface on how much you want to spend. But like Liz says, you can spend, you can. Spend a thousand dollars on paint and it'll last you one year, but it's not. I think he's kind of worth just spending the money and making sure you do everything right. I want to reiterate that point about prep and surface. We just earlier today did a, a, a session some people may have tuned in for called the practical aspects of mural painting. We had Sean James and John Pounds, Sean's from Baltimore and John's from Chicago, talk about murals, and it was like a textbook in an hour, but um, so you might want to go back and watch that. But they really went into that surface prep, how important yeah. that is. And um, that if there are cracks, they're going to keep getting bigger. They're going to keep yeah. moving to prepping that. But that reminds me, Stuart, of what you've done on these um, boxes that you can't just go put this wraps on like a sticker, right? Like you really have to make sure. No, you've got to prep them. The, the uh, folks who do the, who do the technical aspect of, of wrapping, technical it's 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 giant vinyl wallpaper but uh you know if you don't do it right it will peel and so the the surfaces really have to be perfectly prepped um you have to remove all trace of placards billboards glue um anything if uh if the boxes have uh sharp metal raised portions because uh, they've been keyed or or knifed or banged into you've got to uh smooth those down there's a, quite a bit of prep involved um and uh additionally there are sometimes more than sometimes hornets bees rats and other creatures and i'm not going to say anything more about the other creatures but uh, so you've got to prep that because uh, you're gonna you're gonna pay more if 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 your installer is dealing with any of those items. So uh, we we basically have to fumigate these things first. Um, we have to make sure that all the vent holes are functioning because we'll be held responsible for everything within if for some reason they fail while the wraps are on. And usually, one of the reasons these things can fail is if they get too hot. Hence, they have the, the, the ports or fins uh, for ventilation. Some of them actually have uh, thermostats and, and fans, and those activate when they get too hot. And they're inherently um, gathering heat as they sit in the sun. Um, they start out with stainless steel boxes for the most part now, although there's plenty of painted ones. And so all of that, if, if the paint is peeling, you've, you've also got to address that before your installer comes in, uh, unless you want to pay for that too. So that, the, yeah. the cost of the box is going to vary um, depending on what you're budgeting for the art, whether you want original art or not. Um, and, uh, you know, one artist, many artists, um, 
and and uh, as well the variance size and in texture. So we we get we get bids that are very varied for for the application of the material and no warranty because it's out in public. Um, did your budget change when you switched from the will lease your art to your RFQ process of soliciting new designs? I'm sorry, say that again. When you you sort of walked us through how you started and just mm -hmm. um, said you know send us your pre-existing works and then you moved into the work with Casa where you're really like commissioning new branded work. Did mm -hmm. your budget go up for those? Oh, absolutely, considerably. Yeah, I mean when you're talking about a design process, you know we we want our artists to earn a good living, and so you know we try as hard as we can to get as much money into the art budget as as possible. Now, all that being said, another aspect that I didn't talk about is who owns the wrap? Who's responsible for it? Um, so in every agreement, we've had to you know, confront uh, an agency or a utility that wants nothing to do with the obligation of the, of the material. And if it gets damaged, we have to remove it. And in fact, our agreements vary in time and we have to remove it anyway. So. Uh, at the end of a process, we're going to be going out and undoing what's been done if the demand to take the art down comes. So we price a life cycle project. And, and so um, each of these wraps uh, may, may run between $22 and $2,700, depending on the, the size. But what happens is the jurisdictions uh, are saving a lot of money because they have contracts with uh, folks who are supposed to clean up the graffiti. I mean, mm. you know, a splash of paint to prep the next uh, the next uh, markup is not really a, an effective use of money. But uh, so we're saving the agency's money when we do this as well. So that that's great, a great point. Someone, um, Kathy O'Dell, I saw asked about maintenance and you you can maybe justify that you're actually saving from graffiti abatement by, by investing in the wraps. Shelton and Liz, how maybe does maintenance consider, you know, factor into yours? I'm sure there are people who run parks or own businesses who think I don't want to have to maintain a bike rack or have to maintain a basketball court if it's paint. All right, Shelton, your turn. Oh, I was gonna say ladies first. Okay, so so <laughs> first we did ours, we partnered with the town. So the town owns the actual park. So they already do the maintenance and and uh and the hockey, you know, but Every time somebody if something happens at the park, like people call me and be like, "Hey, it's some trash out here," so I kind of go out there. So I think since people know that I actually painted the park, they feel like that I'm supposed to do all the, a lot of the maintenance, which I don't mind because I grew up playing on that basketball court too. But um, the town here, so international, you can't do that everywhere. So yeah, so the, the best thing is to like partner with the town or the city too, so they already do all the grass cutting and the, and the maintenance of the court anyway. Or the outside of court, so. Liz, does that factor, does maintenance factor into some of your advice around bike racks that they're, if they're too unique, they are harder to maintain? I mean, I'm just kind of. Yeah, I mean, I think like, I think the main thing is how long will they be a secure bike rack that people will want to use? So like over time, they might just need to be reinforced or new footers or uh, maybe even relocate it a lot that happens a lot of times like there's construction that happens or road maintenance or um you know water main work or like you know a lot of stuff happens where concrete um in the public right away needs to get ripped up so like that's one thing i think mean, it's hard to say who maintains it because maybe it's a a bid you know that redesigned a public square maybe it's um a school that that purchased public art but I think the main thing to consider in terms of maintenance is, and it's just like in public art, you want to have a plan for maintenance because the second it becomes blighted, then that just creates a lot of like people giving up on investing in projects like that. And so I'll say as a bike advocate, like people already have really strong feelings about bikes <laughs> um, and yeah. what they, and their place in public space. And, and so sometimes those feelings get expressed by immediately being over uh, providing a lot of extra scrutiny on bike infrastructure and that includes bike racks like businesses not wanting them there um so i think like 
the more plan you have to maintain them, the more it just helps overall with community relations. Right. And, have a, and have a champion, you know, that's not just necessarily you. Like have a business that's really excited it's there. Have a city that's really excited it's there. That is an awesome transition into having an advocate. Goes to our last question I want to take. Uh, Marjorie Blystone has a, a very specific question that, that Stuart, you might want to follow up on about um, working with Delmarva Power Utility on utility boxes. But I think just generally it's clear that you all are, are not stopped by the first no or deterred by things and, and you've all benefited your communities greatly through that um, perseverance. So um, maybe do you have any parting advice for, for when you get those no's? Do you go over the head of that person or what do you, what's, what's you, you, the them? You never want to go over the head or behind anybody, you want to you want to have them bring you along because ultimately they're saying yes is what brings the credit for the project. And this is public art. It's it's for everybody. It's if you have to do that, it's because you have what I like to call an insincere and uncaring bureaucracy, and that happens sometimes. I I. You know, I don't experience that with the Maryland State Arts Council ever. Uh, you know, we have amazing partners in almost all the all the state departments. But I, I don't mind saying there are elements in the State Highway Administration that are focused on their mission and only their mission. And so as a result, what you're doing has no consequence. And so if you can't persuade somebody, well, that's after, I, I figure you give two and a half years of, of persuasion time. After that, it's time to go to the mat. <laughs> that's good so I don't wait two and a half years. <laughs> 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 um, definitely, we have a different relationship um, with our city government and even with our public and private entities. And so I think, um, I'll say this, like, I can really only speak for like installing bike grass. And so that's one perspective. And I do think that if it's wrapped up in a public art project, you end up bringing more people into the process. And I think that does speak to the value of pursuing it because you, sometimes I'm not always the best messenger. So if I have somebody sort of not in bike world um, that doesn't have to also fight city hall every day, um, then they are gonna be the advocate that we need to move things along. That said, sometimes creating that pressure really does work. And one example I'll use is we had um, a series of businesses near our office that really wanted bike parking. They're like, look, we're losing business because there's no place. Our customers come on bike and there's no place to park bikes here. And so they just couldn't wait for the city any longer. So we used one of our contacts to purchase. We purchased um, as a nonprofit the things it cost to install um, a bike corral and just have it be like our project and as soon and then we and then the businesses created like a flyer for a party to celebrate like our advocacy bringing it and as soon as that Facebook event hit the internet DOT was out there the next day installing the racks so it's like so then we had like all these racks that were like okay well where do they go but uh, it was a good problem to have and so I think also being creative um, both about who you bring into your project and be really strategic about that um, and then, you know, it's okay to apply pressure in creative ways. And, and for me, uh, I, you know, I saw the letter that I wrote in 2006. So it took me till 2018 to actually get a, a yes. So sometimes you can't like Amazing. give up. You just got to just keep going and keep going until you find the right opportunity or the right person. Um, the idea never changed. Just the people around me kind of changed and they put me in a different room and, and different conversations. So once that happened, I think like people started liking the, the, the idea of the project, but the project never changed. So don't never second guess, you know, your dream or, or your vision. You just got to get around the right people. Somebody got to give you a chance or the right platform. And then once that happens, then it changes everything. And so like the same people at the town where I live at who didn't think it was a good idea in 2006 was here in 2019 celebrating when Good Morning America came, they was all happy and all this other stuff. So it was like it was the same idea, but nothing changed. But to me, being uh, I try to relate everything to sports. When you win a championship, everybody gets a ring. It doesn't matter who's the best player on the court. At the end of the day, we all get a ring. We all get to celebrate. So yeah. you're here. 
Couldn't end on better words. It's, and you also got a really snazzy logo in that time. Like you went, you you came oh, with yeah. a letterhead too. <laughs> did you see the first? Did y'all see the, my first sketch? Oh my goodness! Yeah. That's what it was. So, but I had to really like take some time to go do some research. Like you said, I literally traveled around the world for like two years to see and understand. Like, okay, what is a really cool court? And you know, now we have opportunities to maybe do some amazing things. So, research, practice, perseverance. You guys embody it. Thank you all. Thanks for everybody who tuned in until six o'clock. Go be with your people you love. Stay safe. Stay healthy. Thanks for tuning in. And there's a survey I think we're supposed to take. I don't know where the link is for that, but maybe it'll be emailed out like a session survey. But we appreciate you being here. Thanks for yeah. Thanks for the invitation and thanks yeah. to everybody watching. We appreciate you. Thanks. And feel free to follow up, uh, you know, in the future. Thank you. Thank all you. Right. Bye. Bye. Oh.